Good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Pratibha Singhal, pulmonologist from Mumbai. And uh, it gives me great pleasure this evening to be moderating one of the CCI webinars. As usual, we have a CCI webinar every week on Thursday evening without a repetition of the topics. And this time, it's a very unique topic of sickle cell disease and pulmonary involvement. Um, it uh, gives me great pleasure to announce that CCI has completed four years of uninterrupted uh, webinars. Uh, Bijal, if you could please display the slide. We all know that uh, CCI was a very unique uh, concept that was founded initially over just a WhatsApp group. And when they started these webinars on 5th April 2020, they have gone on to have uninterrupted webinars every week on a Thursday evening for the last four years. Come hail, come storm, come COVID, nothing has stopped them. And we have not had any repetition of any topics. It's always very unique topics that has uh, that is being uh, you know, done. And as you can see, today's topic is also something very interesting. Some people said, oh, wow, what is this? We don't even know that this is this exists. And it's very nice to know that there are gurus from all over the country, north, south, east, west, which have participated in these webinars. We have, of course, Dr. Krishna, which is uh, who has been the brainchild of CCI and has been the driving force behind these uh, webinars. Uh, Vijal, if you could go to the next slide, please. And we have uh, Vijay Kumar Chinam Chetty from Hyderabad, who has been the coordinator and uh, uh, you know the sutradhar for these webinars. And I must congratulate all of them for having these uninterrupted webinars. So with that, moving on, I think let me introduce our uh, panelists for today. We have with us uh, Dr. Chetan Rao, who is a consultant interventional pulmonologist and a transplant pulmonologist from the Yashoda Group of Hospitals, Hyderabad. We have with us Dr. Uh, Hiranapa Udnur, who is, is a consultant pulmonologist at Manipal and Baptist Hospital, Hibal, and also attached to the Inspire Speciality Clinic in Bangalore. Uh, we have Anirudh Saini. Hi, Anirudh who is a consultant pulmonologist at Metromas Hospital in Jaipur. And last but not the least, we have Abhishek Agrawal, who is a pulmonologist attached uh, with an interest in interventions and is attached to Dispur Hospital, Gauhati, Assam. So the flow for today is going to be, uh, Dr. Chetan is going to present us with two case scenarios to get the ball rolling. And then we will move on to panel discussion. So Chetan, I please uh, request you to uh, start your presentation. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the introduction, madam. And uh, it gives me immense pleasure to be a part of this fourth anniversary webinar of CCI and kudos to everyone who made it possible. And as you already said, this is a pretty interesting topic, uh, which I'm sure most of, the, most of us were not aware of. And uh, I would start with uh, two case scenarios of how uh, we uh, look into a pulmonary complication of a sickle cell disease. So let me go through the first case. I hope my slides are visible. Yeah. Yeah. So this is an 18 year old male with no known comorbidities and he was diagnosed to have sickle cell disease two years back when he was being evaluated for anemia. So after that, uh, during that admission, he was given some simple transfusions to maintain the target hemoglobin level and was discharged and was pretty asymptomatic after that. So now after two years, he presented uh, to the OPD with severe back pain for two days, which were treated with analgesics at home, but with no major relief. So he came back to the hospital uh, because of persisting pain. And on presentation, on evaluation, his saturation on room air was 95%. Uh, so his baseline was always been 94 to 96%. Pulse rate was one or two breath, uh, beats per minute. So he was having tachycardia. Uh, lab investigation showed a hemoglobin of 12. Uh, WBC count of 10,200, which is again normal. But CRP was significantly elevated up to 54. And on auscultation, the lungs were clear. So he was admitted to the hospital with a provisional diagnosis of vasoclusive crisis because he was having severe uh, bone pains. And he was admitted for further management. So after admission, he was started on IV tramadol for analgesia. Uh, he was uh, maintained, uh, adequate hydration was maintained. 
and also on low molecular weight heparin and vitals were closely monitored this is a usual uh, protocol of managing a vasoocclusive crisis if you don't feel any symptomatic relief on opd basis treatment you have supposed to be admitted and then treated with iv analgesics preferably opioids so his pain further worsened the next day despite being on all this treatment and he was shifted to the icu for iv fentanyl infusion because he was not being uh, symptomatically relieved just with tramadol and for further more close monitoring so the very next day he started complaining of non productive cough difficulty in breathing severe chest pain more on the right side and later uh, he also had a fever spike and the clinical team on examination found out that he was tachypneic respiratory rate was around 26 per minute there was tachycardia which was sent from the baseline and saturation on room air was 91% if you noticed his heat it was 95% on admission and now on auscultation there were bilateral crackles pre predominantly on the right side so this is third day after admission so now uh, the labs were redone if you can see there's significant fall in hb which came down to 7.8 crp hiked up 1 or 2 and wbc count also increased that is and with a neutrophilic predominance so this was a x ray on the day he was sent and if you can see there are significant bilateral uh confluent opacities not confined to a single lobe or segment so uh, what do you think the diagnosis would be here if anyone can take a chance like okay. so a person who is already admitted with a vasoocclusive crisis presenting with acute chest symptoms with infiltrates on an x-ray which were not there previously the diagnosis is acute chest syndrome so this is a very usual presentation wherein a person ad is admitted to the hospital for a vasoocclusive crisis and then it progresses to acute chest syndrome in the hospital this is a first uh, case scenario let me also present to you a second case scenario again pertaining to acute chest syndrome yeah before that uh, this guy this patient was treated with iv antibiotics hydration hydroxyurea analgesics oxygen support and intermittent niv and blood transfusion i'm not uh, going into detail of the uh, treatment modalities because this will be this will be discussed as we go on and post treatment this is the x ray you can see it clean there is a significant recovery so acute chest syndrome identified early and treated well you really see good uh, response so now going into the second case scenario this is again a 17 year old male patient who is already a known case of hbsc disease so hbsc is as a heterozygous trait where there is hemoglobin s and hemoglobin e also so he presents with a history of chest and back pain for few days prior to admission and uh, on presentation he again complained of non productive cough for two days but denied fever so on examination his heart rate was 110 so there was tachycardia his respiratory rate was around 25 so there was tachypnea and temperature was normal on chest examination he had left basal crackles with decreased air entry this was the labs that was sent on admission if you can see the wbc count was normal rbcs were within normal range hb was 13.3 and there was platelet in the normal range but crp is significantly elevated with a negative procalcitonin and this is the x ray So if you see, there's a, say, a dense consolidation patch in the left lower zone, obscuring the CP angle as well as the left dome of diaphragm. So he was provisionally diagnosed to have community-acquired pneumonia, and then he was treated uh, with antibiotics based on CAP guidelines on ceftriaxone and azithromycin. But despite which, the patient did improve and slowly he worsened. Started requiring oxygen two days after admission. he further became tachypneic and there was tachycardia that was worsening so he was shifted to the icu where he was started on non invasive ventilation all the infective workup was negative so the hematologist was called on because he was already a known case of uh, hbsc then the hematologist actually recommended to go for a hemoglobin electrophoresis with a suspicion of acute chest syndrome so this is the report of hemoglobin electrophoresis where you can see the hbs and hb er significantly elevated and sickle cell was positive so this is for sure a case of acute chest syndrome again in a known case of hbse so the patient later underwent a session of exchange transfusion and then during the follow up 
he uh, following days the patient improved gradually and was discharged from the hospital four days after the exchange transfusion and later he was uh, started on folic acid and hydroxyurea which is the usual guideline so these are the two case scenarios about uh, acute chest syndrome or two different ways how uh, acute chest syndrome patients present to you i'll quickly uh, uh, talk about the Uh, pathophysiology or pathogenesis of acute uh, chest syndrome these are the four uh, etiologies that are implicated first is fat embolism because of bone marrow infarcts and necrosis infection uh, uh, most of the community acquired organisms and viruses can cause thromboembolic disease and atelectasis atelectasis is because of hypoventilation when your rib cage is in for involved with infarct and because of pain the patient tends to hyperventilate that causes atelectasis pulling of secretions and further infections so all these etiologies lead to acute chest syndrome which presents as clinical symptoms like chest pain cough wheezing rails tachypnea tachycardia increased work of breathing and fever there are new onset radiological infiltrates which were not there before and ventilator ventilation vq mismatch and hypoxia this is again to explain the pathogenesis so uh, microvascular occlusion bone marrow infarction that leads to uh fat embolism and there is secretory phospholipase increase infections and some uh inflammatory cascade all leading to acute chest syndrome acute chest syndrome again in turn leads to vq mismatch desaturated hemoglobin decreased oxygen delivery hypoxia and again vasoclusive crisis so this is a visual cycle that goes on until unless you break it it is uh, it leads to severe morbidity and mortality and now just to brush in with chronic complications i am not taking any case scenarios of chronic complications because this is just the same even in sickle cell disease or non sickle cell disease just to mention restrictive lung disease in sickle cell disease is called sickle cell chronic lung disease wherein there is a documented fibrosis at least on the ct scan if you can see there is subpleural honeycombing and reticulations here which is consistent with uh, fibrosis and in sickle cell disease the fibrosis is predominantly uh, basal and the other uh, common chronic complication is uh, pulmonary hypertension and that is diagnosed on ct scan just like your regular other cases of pulmonary hypertension wherein you look at the ratio of the pulmonary artery to uh, ascending aorta that is greater than 1 and you can see the segmental artery size is relatively big as compared to the bronchus so these are the signs that are seen in this case of sickle cell disease for diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension the other chronic complications can be asthma or reactive airway disease in sickle cell disease and pulmonary embolism or uh, leading to cdef so these are increased the acute and uh, chronic complications of uh, the sickle cell uh, disease on lung and how can a patient present to you in uh, acute chest syndrome the two different scenarios okay uh thank you chetan for running us through those lovely cases and uh, i think the important thing here to remember is that uh i think sickle cell and lung involvement is something that is very often missed because very often physicians don't know about it as you said i think a lot of the things even i was reading up i realized some of the things that i didn't know existed with sickle cell and lung so it's 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 a very interesting topic and it's great that we have uh, all of you here so to start right off let's start with dr uh, hiranappa would you just like to tell us what exactly is sickle cell anemia and consequently what is uh, sickle cell disease the sickle cell uh, anemia and the sickle cell disease is uh, due to one of the hemoglobinopathy normally we see if the hemoglobin is uh, carries the oxygen along with it so in a sickle cell disease one of the amino acids uh, will be replaced so that its structural integrity of uh, doing that function which is designed for uh, having the rbc's roll over in the blood vessels uh, and reaches the circulation reaches the venous uh, and come back to the heart so when this happens this uh, uh, sickle sickling is a sickling of the blood vessel it looks like uh, which uh, whichever doesn't looks like rbc it doesn't roll over fastly and it actually goes in the end vessel where it can't penetrate further and causes a blockage there and this sickling sickling is uh, the reason for it to be called as sickle cell disease the rbc is uh, uh, time duration is 120 days normally when it sickles it dies faster 
so regeneration from the bone marrow increases and this this is one kind of disease where hemolysis will act, uh, happen and rbc's lifespan will decrease correct so i think the important thing to remember here is that uh, it's not uncommon it is seen in about 2 to 3 lakh with major hemoglo uh, hemoglobinopathies and like what we think of that it is not a very common disease it is seen not only we know that it is very common in the african american population but it's also seen in the mediterranean eastern europe and asian population so it's not an uncommon disease in the rest of the world also it's not common only in africa and it's a homozygous sickle cell mutation right so that is what sickle cell anemia is and when we yeah. talk about sickle cell disease it's a group of hemoglobinopathy which yeah, can include yeah. what chetan said about it could be hbs it could be hbe included right so that's yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a homo homozygous ss variety it might be sickle cell trait or it might be a mixed form of sickle cell with the thalassemia variant it becomes on the parent lineage from the yes. father and mother if it is a homozygous it manifests yes so great so moving on uh, uh, we have uh, we have a next question for uh, uh, dr nanirod how do we diagnose sickle cell disease in our practice is it easy to diagnose or uh, do we always need a hematopathologist suppose a patient has presented to you for the first time with say fever cough breathlessness like one of this typical young patient adolescent patient what chetan has said would it be easy for us to pick it up or would it always have to be a diagnosed patient well uh, sickle cell anemia the disease has to be first of all suspected based on the symptoms of the patient and as we all know as we all have read that uh, it is caused by a point mutation the hbb gene uh, which codes for the beta sub unit of the hemoglobin so one only one uh, adeni uh, adeni is replaced by high amine so it causes the substitution of one amino acid to another amino acid glutamic acid is replaced by valine and it uh, causes the whole hemoglobin molecule to become distorted it becomes hbs so we have to uh, uh, to diagnose that we have to hit on that thing to diagnose it so it's not uh, like that that always we need to have a uh, uh, hematopathologist to diagnose it uh, any practicing pathologist can diagnose it diagnose it uh, based on the pbf finding based on the symptoms and the if the hemoglobin electrophoresis test is available there as uh, dr chetan rao has beautifully shown in the previous slides that uh, how the hbs percentage and percentage and uh, other hemoglobin percentage was calculated so based on the symptoms and uh, the hemoglobin electrophoresis findings uh, it can be diagnosed so uh, we don't need always a hematopathologist to diagnose that even in uh, general hospitals it can be diagnosed where we have uh, sufficient facilities so this is my take on it so that's 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 a nice uh, summarization so just to add one or two things i think what chetan presented is both the patients were known cases right they have they were previously diagnosed cases i think sometimes it becomes difficult when a patient is coming to you with an acute uh, chest syndrome spectrum with fever cough pain disseminated shadows hypoxia it becomes difficult sometimes because we are not always thinking of these things so i think some clues would be if the patient has anemia if the patient has is uh, you know laboratory finding suggestive of hemolysis and hemolytic anemia and if you have uh, uh, your you know on the peripheral smear somebody is very sensible and picks up those sickle cells you know that could give you a clue of course hemoglobin electrophoresis is needed for diagnosis but how to pick it up if it's not a diagnosed case always i think sometimes we don't ask history you know we don't ask patients nowadays whether there is a history of a sickle cell trait in the family i think that is also important especially when you have a younger patient coming to you you know like an adolescent patient coming to you with like an acute florid acute chest syndrome kind of a picture what he has mentioned i think it would be important that we go back and ask history from the family also then you know that that will raise our suspicion so uh, moving on um, abhishek uh, i think uh, chetan has already kind of mentioned but with this background what all pulmonary manifestations how all could the lung be involved in sickle cell disease if you could uh, just elucidate that again please ma'am uh, and sickle cell anemia as you have already said that uh, we have very less knowledge about it as we have encountered very less uh, cases in our practice till uh, in fact uh, pre uh, this one uh, had uh, hydroxyurea era where the more children were affected and used to have more mortality 
from sickle cell anemia due to lung involvement. But with the uh, increase in prophylaxis, penicillin, hydroxyurea use, vaccinations, increase of the knowledge, uh, increasing screening of the children for sickle cell anemia, and uh, making parents aware about it, the it's uh, the manifest pulmonary manifestation is from children to adult. Earlier, more manifestation were seen in children. Now the age group has also changed of them uh, from uh, now adult we get more adult with sickle cell anemia and the, earlier the mortality was in the younger age group now the mortality has increased to for uh, life expectancy has increased to 42 to 48 years year of age usually the present in the childhood they present with a uh, age unit tonsillar hypertrophy which leads to uh, breathing difficulty the patient can have uh, sleep apnea syndromes as uh, Dr. Chetan has already explained to us about uh, acute chest syndrome very nicely. Patient present with fever, new onset of uh, chest excess swelling, finding of uh, infiltrates, hypoxia. Then uh, patient can have, have asthma, which usually mimics acute chest syndrome with viral LRTI. Then uh, they can have thromboembolism, which may be acute or chronic. Uh, then uh, we can have pulmonary fibrosis in uh, case of sickle cell anemia patient. Then pulmonary hypertension, which is the second most common cause of mortality among sickle cell anemia case and the most common cause of uh, most common uh, cause in the adult for uh, death. So these are the common which uh, and we again we have ma'am pulmonary this one in PFT also we can see the respiratory changes like obstructive uh, changes we can see restriction we can see them mixed pattern also we can see. So. In case of sickle, we can find a variety of uh, pulmonary manifestation, which we need to know. And uh, also, we, wherever we get a call of a sickle cell patient, we should keep in mind about these symptoms. I think thromboembolism also can be part of the spectrum. And I think why we are discussing yeah. is that uh, the data suggests that more than 20% patients can have fatal pulmonary complications. Fatal pulmonary complications. sickle cell disease, you know, and sometimes we don't realize it because, as I said, we are not aware of it. So, not, not aware. Uh, yes. So, moving on, uh, Anirudh, if you could uh, tell us again what is acute chest syndrome. I know we are talking about this again. Chetan has already mentioned it, but it is important because this is something which has a very florid manifestation. And it has a, a very high fatality also. It can about 25% of deaths in uh, sickle cell disease are usually due to acute uh, chest syndrome. So Anirudh, please do enlighten us. Uh, Ma'am, uh, as uh, Dr. Chetan Rao has already shown us and uh, what we know about this disease is that uh, as uh, uh, Hiranapa sir has also beautifully explained the uh, uh, my, how the, the, about the microscopic findings that what happens actually the sickle cell how they cannot move further in the vasculature and they cause uh, they get uh, clogged and they uh, occlude, uh, they occlude the pulmonary vasculature and it leads to deoxygenation and it uh, deoxygenation of hemoglobin and which further leads to sickling and it, uh, uh, it it's like a vicious cycle which causes uh, the symptoms to uh, the pathology to progress uh, rapidly in the symptoms like chest pain, uh, shortness of breath, uh, uh, these to progress very fast. And uh, uh, so uh, we have to suspect based on uh, based on the history and symptoms first we have to suspect and if the patient is deteriorating fast and uh, oxygenation saturation is dropping, new pulmonary infiltrates are appearing especially in a young patient and uh, uh, PB, we have to just like you had you had already, uh, already told that uh, we have to take the history from uh, the parental history also that if they have any uh, single cell trait like thing. So uh, it's uh, like uh, uh, it causes, it's a vicious cycle which causes the uh, occlusion of the pulmonary vasculation and uh, it leads to chest pain, shortness of breath, saturation falling uh, rapidly. And uh, uh, patient, this uh, is the, in fact, it's, it is the most common cause of death among the sickle cell disease patient. So this becomes uh, uh, one of the most important things. And uh, so after diagnosing it, uh, uh, the management is very simple. Uh, it's uh, about the pain control, oxygen support, IV fluids, antibiotics, and uh, 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 anti-thrombotic agents, as Dr. Chetan Rao has already told us. And uh, 
or uh, sometimes the patient needs blood transfusion which can further lead to other complications which we all already know so uh, there are some uh, risk factors for it uh, for it which can uh, which uh, i uh, think you should consider like if the patient is young there is history of asthma if the patient is smoker all or patient has already undergone a surgery or had uh, some trauma so you should suspect uh, that more that uh, and uh, then the management part is there of course i never had a chance to manage such a case by myself so this is my take on this yeah okay so uh i think just to add to that because you mentioned the risk factors there has been interestingly some other risk factors also which have been mentioned is a high stable wbc count a leukocyte count has been known to be a risk factor and of course if there has been a history of avascular necrosis of any bone then again our antenna should go up you know that this could be an acute uh, chest syndrome yes uh, chetan or uh, Uh, Doctor Hinanapa, would you like to add something? Then please. There are yeah. other uh, risk factors also for an acute chest syndrome, like just like you said, high stable leukocytosis, high stable hemoglobin also is a risk factor when you see a sick, already a diagnosed sickle cell disease, and low levels of fetal hemoglobin on protein electrophoresis is again a risk factor because fetal hemoglobin is considered to be protective. So when yes. the levels are low, it is again a high risk factor for acute chest syndrome. and as already pointed 25% of deaths in sickle cell disease are because of acute uh, chest syndrome and the data says that uh, the chances of every patient of sickle cell disease having acute chest syndrome is more than 50% so probably i mean now that we all know that most of us haven't managed the case so probably we missed a lot is what right. i feel correct yeah correct. I, i i happened to see one patient in initially in the career, uh, career. in 10 years back and uh, he was a security guy and uh, is a known case of security. earlier when i was young i was diagnostic euphoria was there diagnosis <laughs> was more important for me now after 10 years i have become slightly smarter for me therapy is more important for me <laughs> uh, so when 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 it really comes with a chest pain if it is a known devil you know that it is sickle cell and it come with chest pain we we were reading lot of books and we would have read somewhere and all it just uh, blinks just just clicks when you go to the er and we start doing the things accordingly so if it is a non sickle cell disease then it is not sickle unless a pathology sees in a per, uh, peripheral smear he gives us some there is something hemoglobinopathy means then we involve hematologist peripheral smear osmolality test and all those things but our first differential diagnosis of chest syndrome will be pleuritic chest pain or those kind of symptoms only and acs we should not write ACS is now you should write acute chest syndrome now the ACS terminology i am seeing everywhere ACS is cardiac most of the time <laughs> it is angiogram angioplasty the those thing direction only we we give all opportunity for them to do pro bnp pro pi ecg echo all those things are okay if he god forbid it has some amount of ph in echo you'll end up getting a ct pulmonary angio and we see there is no thromboembolism we still have acute chest syndrome means we think it is some kind of in fact we still have access to a uh, ventilatory perfusion uh, mismatch studies and d dimers and we just when we keep on traveling and navigate a pa- patient so you are not able to explain sometimes we see after two days we may see a herpes on the chest so most of the chest syndrome presents like this only a rib a rib fracture will be there or something else will be there as a di- differential diagnosis so when, when you really get and you get that clue when there is a sickling or anything then you go behind that then definitely we will get a answer of sickle cell disease and diagnosis both and this might be a chest syndrome most of the time we are looking at a patient related factor and a disease related factor as a risk factor actually dr chetan has told a regional hypoxia any hypoxia will precipitate sickling so you need a good oxygen therapy need oxygenate well sickling will stop hydrate well sickling will stop so these are all simple bit uh, bit things which will which are important in management of the disease you don't need a high end medications most of the time we we, we add low molecular weight heparins and sometimes we add an antibiotic and uh, when it is acute presentation and the patient is reasonably young and a pediatric case group it becomes very tough in counseling but if it's a known case it becomes easy involve hematologist who is in every day following the patient well then our job becomes very easy in explaining 
sometimes we have to use fentanyl and other things uh, to get this uh, pain pain will be dis uh, disproportionate and uh, we see a pleural pathology mesothelioma presents like this these are all differential diagnosis and normally nobody comes with acute chest syndrome diagnosis it's impossible we are going to get it uh, while evaluation only and at the discharge diagnosis will be acute chest syndrome rather than presentation absolutely i think in all probability if initially it is missed it is only once we have run through the whole gamut and we are realizing that there's something that we are missing and when the peripheral smear shows up sickling and then you call the hematologist and then they start the thing that's when this whole thing starts but as usual as you very rightly said in fact that good you brought this up because i was going to ask you only what other differential diagnosis would you suspect when a patient comes like this so you've already mentioned you already mentioned See, it, it is a, it is herpes acute herpes no if you don't have a clinical acute chest syndrome most important thing my brother had a acute chest syndrome yeah, uh, acute chest syndrome like presentation and the bp went up high we still have to do iotogram we are not able to get just around the nipple after two days we got a herpes See, it's so horrifying doing an angiogram and this thing na so these are the differential diagnosis like coarctations and acute chest syndrome presentation echo is being normal all other cardiac evaluation being normal pulmonary embolism unexplained disproportionate chest pain or breathlessness hypotension this can be a differential diagnosis acute veno occlusive cases and pulmonary thromboembolism and acute chest syndrome are closely hand in hand only we have to move and uh, other causes of chest syndrome like sometimes uh, uh, connective tissue disorder like uh, sles and all they present like pleuritic chest pain sometimes injury over the chest and uh, those things uh, these are the differential diagnosis normally we look into uh, um, th th these are the common differential diagnosis presenting like a chest pain presenting like a chest pain uh, so and the pulmonary yeah. it's a greatest yeah. mascot is uh, pulmonary embolism only embolism yes so the key thing that you have mentioned is that you know if you have a young patient who comes with cough breathlessness fever and uh, you know x-ray shadows but the key thing is chest pain i think that is what is a key thing and which is different from any other infections because otherwise a young patient who comes with all these symptoms the first thing you will think of is an infection right i mean those shadows that uh, in the first case that chetan showed could very easily be bronchopneumonia when you see in a young patient yeah it's so true, it's, true. it's important that chest pain is the one thing that is a very very sensitive indicator thing that okay this is something other than infection and let's rule out all these other differential diagnoses and of course if there is a sickle cell trait in the family if it's an undiagnosed patient then you start the work up and if it is a diagnosed patient then you take that as one of the differential diagnoses so moving on chetan i think coming back to you uh we are going back to this again but if it's not a known case both your cases that you presented had a history suppose your cases did not have a history then how would you think <laughs> of this to be an acute chest syndrome because i think that's the most difficult situation to be in yeah so just like uh, you pointed out some time back any other patient who doesn't have any comorbidities or it's not at a high risk of such bad infections you already all, always have to rule out an alternative diagnosis and like dr hiranaka sir all outlined there are multiple uh, differential diagnoses so you gradually rule out everything and then uh, look out for an alternative diagnosis i think the clinical clues here are like we already discussed history of uh, hem uh, like uh, hematological disorders in the family history of previous blood transfusions in this particular patient or was there any anemia and uh, the literature says that most of the acute chest syndromes at least 30% of patient who present with acute chest syndrome uh, have a pre uh, vaso occlusive uh, disease yeah so this this always... history is very very important they can yeah. have a finger toe gangrene or they have some veno occlusive when they have put their hand in the uh, cold uh, this thing this, this fine minor clues make you that it is a hypercoagulable state or something which is related to acute chest syndrome also previous dvt makes us aware that it might be pulmonary embolism that's so how this it goes. episode is preceded with some uh, dactylitis or uh, finger pains or lower extremity pains and especially back and chest pains then that is again a clinical clue and then when you start evaluating i think the most sensible first evaluation will be a perif peripheral smear ask your pathologist to give you a peripheral smear if sickle cells are found out there there itself your diagnosis ends the other uh, laboratory clues are uh, uh, signs of hemolytic anemia like increased ldh increased crp despite your wbc count being normal 
so these are other uh, clues that you get on laboratory that lft abnormalities no if there is a indirect hemolysis means bilirubins yes. are yes. high then we suspect and give reticulocyte count there might be if reticulocytes are gone something ongoing uh, bone marrow is challenged so it gives a clue and to make a further evaluations so normally hemolysis is a intravascular hemolysis or extravascular hemolysis we just go in the direction of conceptual evaluation ultimately the roots will get clearer and we will go to the destination of a diagnosis absolutely so, so another I'm, picture yeah. on this uh, peripheral smear or your complete back picture the another hint would be uh, thrombocytosis usually yes. because a sickle cell patient has functional asplenia they tend to have thrombocytosis so thrombocytosis in a background of uh, other normal complete back picture with a raised ldh raised crp and your peripheral smear showing sickle cell disease probably uh, you should have a high suspicion for that and then proceed for your electrophoresis test and all and then you will have a diagnosis so it all starts with your clinical history then basic uh, laboratory investigations then go for your advanced uh, maybe you can even go for your genetic testing and all later on yeah so uh, great chetan and dr hirappa basically to just say the nobody most of them will if is a non sickle case most of them will hide their in, uh, for insurance purpose especially thalassemia patients they sell uh, in in asthma patients <laughs> sir. i write thalassemia at right sir don't write thalassemia at right sir i already had one 5 lakhs uh, this thing don't write anything there anything about thalassemia they have him <laughs> this thing i i normally don't write you take that and you still treat, treat because that, that that query will come to that and insurance rejection definitely will happen because <laughs> it is a congenital disease so they don't they hide they hide the histories correct but as both of you have said nobody who is a diagnosed not a diagnosed case is going to come to you and you're going to say oh this is acute chest syndrome you know you have to obviously it is going to be in a matter of a few days where you're going to come to this conclusion based on it is uh, not working diagnosis madam it is a discharge diagnosis right. absolutely absolutely it is something that you arrive later on in the course not at presentation great so uh, coming back to you dr hirampa uh, i mean we've already said that sickle cell is a hypercoagulable state right so is is the manifestation different from what you would expect in other renal occlusive diseases see it's or in hypercoagulation disease it's multifactorial see whenever the sickling happens and uh, when it uh, really um, platelet stimulations can happen endothelial dysfunction can happen because of uh, it is a secondary hypercoagulable state it's not a primary hypercoagulation slide like, like a apla syndrome or like that it is not a hypercoagulation state like that it is majorly majorly vena occlusive disease because uh, the origin of a hemoglobin is uh, at the bone marrow and it circulates and it may end organ damage in all the organs where the venous and arterial ends there um this uh, oxygen is released and carbon dioxide goes at the end organ if you have some amount of regional hypoxia and it causes a vena occlusive disease repeated vena occlusive disease causes the thrombosis and that thrombosis leads to a further hypoxia in the distal organs it can happen in the chest it can happen in a bone marrow that's what you mentioned in a beautiful slide and a circular slide where it from bone marrow was showed there and the sickling was shown and dr anirudh saini has mentioned that in a blood vessel it travels and all those things sir it is majorly vena occlusive event any vena occlusive event anywhere in the body if it is in the chest it is acute chest syndrome it can happen in a retina it can cause a sudden vision loss it can happen in a particle region aphasia it can cause stroke it can cause heart attack anything which causes a regional circulation and thrombosis arterial or venous thrombosis it's mainly vena occlusive disease predominantly and the manifestations in each organs will be the presentations with the symptoms correct so the, i read something that in an older study that up to 25% of autopsy patients of sickle cell disease had undiagnosed vena occlusive disease so that's a very high percentage you know i think maybe we miss these things in clinical practice now it's a prototype prototype for a vena occlusive disease if you want to absolutely. make a, this thing a rat model or a human model it is a vena occlusive disease model and i think we can't really compare this post mortem studies with our anti mortem st- uh, results yes. because most of these vaso occlusive disease is because of fat embolism and for us it is very difficult to diagnose a fat embolism Oh, uh, uh, like in so even practice, with laparoscopic biopsy or clinical. So absolutely. that probably that is the disparity between postmortem results and uh, when we do clinical. Absolutely. So uh, I mean, 
how do we uh, assess this is d dimer uh, i mean d dimer is a good criteria to suspect it or would not really because uh, no, from normally d dimer has a negative predictive value yes. a negative d dimer can rule out dbt and pulmonary embolism and now we are started using in covid on all kind diseases it is high and the type it is done whether the what method is done if it is negative d dimer it rules out pulmonary embolism if it is positive you still need to evaluate so we still rule out dbt and pulmonary embolism and that is our most common diagnosis before going to a veno occlusive diseases so you do a ctpa you may not get 95 7% of the time you may get some kind of thrombosis you can miss 3% of chain you can add it to a perfusion study or ventilation we can really rule out if the hypoxia is really not explainable and sometimes you do a dbt screening or arterial or venous so the thromboembolism can happen in uh, sickling uh, sickle disease because it is not in the vessel it is in the hemoglobin see most of the time they we are in a vessel dbt screening it is in the vessel and arterial it is in the vessel this is in the hemoglobin problem any vessel can get affected so it can cause thrombosis and uh, uh, those kind of things and uh, so d dimer can say thrombosis anywhere in the body so d dimer we should not depend on a negative d dimer definitely rules out pulmonary embolism and dbt so yeah. it rules out thrombosis or thrombotic event anywhere in the body so yeah. po- positive means you need to evaluate further correct so i was reading that in in sickle cell disease you have a baseline elevated d dimer anyway so it is not like you have to do further investigations to diagnose pulmonary embolism and how yes, would you treat them you know if you have a patient who's had uh, evidence once would you give lifelong anticoagulation therapy or would it be like how you give it for other diseases where it is unproved and you stop treatment it, after is 3 to 6 it's it's a, it's a very difficult question madam because uh, unless there is a proof of uh, thrombotic event uh, or they have a retinal vein thrombosis they have a previous uh, veno occlusive event uh, if there is a thrombosis risk is high anticoagulants definitely helps if any two events if it happening recurrency in a span of two times you need a recurrent dbt if it is happened we give lifelong anticoagulant irrespective of whatever pathology is the recurrent pulmonary embolism if there are two or three events anticoagulants is safe it's good unless there is no contraindications like upper gi bleed or a neuro event or anything or a liver issue which uh, or a kidney issue which prevents them if the thrombocytopenia any other associated disease anticoagulants if they have a recurrent thrombotic events definitely helps as a routinely sickle cell nowhere else they have mentioned that anticoagulants have been needed if it is definite dbt and pulmonary embolism we treat in a first event there is no evidence of lifelong anticoagulants for that but if they have a recurrent events definitely anticoagulants well fit by novax or acitrom should be okay and i think here the mantra will be prevention is better than cure Yes. because the major culprits for vasoclusive disease be it any organ and sickle cell disease is deoxygenation and hyperviscosity so you have to always focus on avoiding these two uh, ensuring adequate oxygenation See, hydration works by a workhorse stride workhorse stride you have a, a vessel injury you have a prothrombotic state and this thing there's no vessel injury here hypercoagulable state and the de- uh, hypoxia this will precipitate uh thromboembolic event so yeah. now the data also says that in the last era after people started uh, using hydroxyurea regularly and early transfusion therapies b- because of which there are no hypoxic events or hyperviscosity events the incidence of acute chest syndrome or any other acute events of significantly come down so i think that is how it is we have to try to prevent it as much as possible for a recurrence pre- prevention we need a good hematologist and uh, probably we need a good hydration we should make sure that they should not go in a high altitudes or they any any situation which causes hypoxia if they have a pneumonia hypoxia their sickle cell crisis can happen sickle cell crisis can happen it might not be only hemolysis or it can be any manifestation so any dehydration hypoxia or anything which causes uh, sickling precipitating factors uh, any drugs it can be drugs also and uh, they can uh, really induce this so while we are on this uh, question there is a uh, topic there is a question from dr tridip chatterjee asking whether acute chen- chest syndrome should be suspected only in patients with sickle cell disease or other hematological diseases as well see sickling any hemoglobinopathy the other hemoglobinopathy like thalassemia so actually thalassemia and sickle cell when it is together it is protective 
there's less sickling okay thalassemia has more of hemolysis it doesn't cause thrombotic event or acute chest syndromes and other hemoglobinopathy is how the polymer is formed uh, it is a beautifully uh, redesigned uh, so that disease causes is re redesigned in such a way that polymers are generated and veno occlusion happens it is a specific sickling event of that any other hemoglobinopathies which are there uh, which i know there are different names for it uh, which doesn't cause uh, occlusion it based on their how how exactly the hemoglobin appears it, it it depends that is the pathophysiology it may lead it is specifically for this uh, sickling ss homozygous and if there is any other homozygous or any other variant it is actually pro uh, protective and chest protective. syndrome will not happen in yeah. those condition Correct. So you mentioned something now about uh, you know oxygen therapy, fluid management, pain management when a patient has this acute chest syndrome. Would you give bronchodilators and antibiotics regularly to these patients? No. Sometimes we have a knee-jerk uh, reactions to add an antibiotic when CRP is elevated. Some it is acute one. We are uh, horrified, especially pulmonologist after this COVID and all. First we will do the RT PCR. First we will do this. Uh, Uh, flu panel and other things we rule out all these acute conditions and uh, definitely if you feel that you are in doubt of differential diagnosis you put an antibiotics no problem no issues you put a uh, community acquired pneumonia cover because sometimes pulmonary infarct and pneumonia is mimic over a period of time when you see their procalcitonins are okay and crp crp can go in inflammatory or infection also yes. so you, you just decide after 48 to 72 hours you can de escalate early so if you don't know you add more things and de escalate and get the diagnosis and then give a specific therapy correct as we already discussed that a baseline stable leukocytosis could anyways be there in these patients so leukocytosis need not necessarily reflect an infection but of course if you have a patient who is worsening despite your initial management you would think of appropriate antibiotics what about role of bronchoscopy uh, chetan would you do a bronc in these patients it would it help you in managing them madam if uh, we are very clear in an already diagnosed case of sickle cell disease the diagnosis is very clear that it's acute chest syndrome and uh, i don't think there's any additional role of your bronchoscopy there until unless the patient has a fulminant sepsis with your rising sepsis markers and you want a proper culture which is not just coming out with sputum otherwise i don't really see any role of bronchoscopy in these patients as such when the diagnosis is very clear otherwise mm -hmm. if if there's not a case of Known case of sickle cell disease, and if you are in a diagnostic dilemma, then probably bronchoscopy will have a role. Correct. I think some data suggests that adding atypical cover along with an antibiotic is a good idea because there has been incidence of mycoplasma chlamydia seen in these patients along with the H influenzae. So What about fifty percent of acute chest syndrome is because of infections? Mm -hmm. So they okay. they suggest that you also have to give a broad spectrum coverage along with an atypical coverage, just like your community acquired pneumonia guide. Correct. What about transfusion, Doctor Hanunappa? I mean, would, is there an ideal hemoglobin that you should maintain? Because uh, Chetan was mentioning that having a very high hemoglobin is also, uh, you know, not good for these patients. See, so he, hemoglobin in ICUs, hemoglobin in ICUs, we need to maintain around eight to ten. No, in ICU people, they don't. Uh, there is a low threshold of transfusion unless it causes some kind of problem. And transfusions, uh, PRBC tra component transfusions and other things, uh, they have come with their own risk. and if it is really causing a drop in hemoglobin and if it is less than 7 or 6 then we can give a transfusions to tide over the crisis tachycardia will come down and other things will come down so uh, we don't get hemoglobin will drop it is not continuously going to drop it will not be drop in like it's like not like a gi bleed so it mm -hmm. should settle once it is those normally it's not required exchange transfusion yes if it is a crisis situations when you are in icu and all uh it helps us to get the patient uh, faster recovery faster recovery path in that kind of situation one or two prbc transfusions around when it is 6 to 7 and uh, and acute presentation definitely uh, improves the hemodynamics and um, and the sickle cells they will uh, uh, die sooner and when you really do a prbc transfusion which are uh, equivalent the blood group matched this thing they may last uh, maybe 30 40 days more and uh, we will get more time to treat them well yeah what about bronchodilators because some data suggests that 
ऑफ <laughs> bronchodilators as a symptomatic therapy uh, it definitely helps in a, this thing once it goes to a restrictive disease like if repeated goes for some amount of fibrosis what you have seen uh, in one of the slides of chetan and uh, there are more basal mimicking like uh, ilds and all if you are not know you will rule out all the connective tissue disorder those kind of situation it may not be much use but a cough as a presentation if it is there that time inhaled steroids and other things might help bronchodilators if there is a bronchospasm we can use it correct so what about steroids in acute chest syndrome uh, chetan any role of steroids would you give not give is there some data so as usual steroids are a double edged sword even in sickle cell crisis so just like the previous topic uh, uh, children with bronchial asthma are four times more prone for uh, acute chest syndrome acute chest syndrome yes and they are there the guidelines say that you have to manage it as bronchial asthma exacerbation be it oral steroids or inhaled steroids but at the same time you also have to uh, have a look on your infection because they already have a functional asthma actually and they, bronchospasm uh, also precipitated precipitates sickle cell crisis yeah bronchospasm will lead to hypoxia hypoxia regional hypoxia regional hypoxia will precipitate this thing by giving bronchodilator and oxygen can be used as a best bronchodilator when you use oxygen drive on nebulization bronchodilator when you really used it because normally sometimes you use oxygen liberal oxygen can be given in asthma exacerbation not in copd we need a controlled oxygen so when you are giving oxygen drive on nebulization sometimes oxygen nebulizations are given by a port and blowers or pages so you can connect it to 10 liters and give oxygen oxygen and bronchodilatation <coughs> definitely reduces the acute chest crisis uh, so bronchodilation and oxygen role is there correct i think uh, in fact steroids have been mentioned that when there is primary veno occlusive disease and you are using steroids it actually increases the rebound attacks as i was reading it somewhere so it has mm-hmm. to be used in the correct scenario you know i mean as as you said it's a double edged sword uh, chetan There is a question from Dr. Trudeep asking about hydroxyurea in acute chest syndrome. Any comments? So hydroxyurea as such doesn't have any role in acute chest syndrome, but once a patient has acute chest syndrome, there is always a chance of recurrence. So to prevent that recurrence, they start hydroxyurea. And the role here is hydroxyurea helps in increasing the level of fetal hemoglobin, and also it decreases the viscosity. So the chance of further acute chest syndrome or any other acute vasoocclusive crisis comes down. So that is the role of hydroxyurea, but it as such doesn't help in any acute setting. It will just prevent relapse. It is, it is like colchicine in goat. <laughs> Correct. And that's what my analogy it goes. You know, you don't give an acute goat uh, colchicine. You, it's, it's a chronic go, goat we give. Probably yes. that that is an extension. It's for prevention like, for know. acute repeated acute uh, chest syndromes rather than treatment of acute chest syndrome. So moving on, uh, Abhishek. uh coming back to uh, chronic complications of sickle cell uh, disease if you could uh, just tell us what are the things that you could come across ma'am as uh, we have discussed about this acute chest syndrome this acute chest syndrome can lead to chronic symptoms like uh, there may be primary upper lung injury which leads to chronic dyspnea and absent again this uh, acute chest syndrome uh, may it leads to chronic Uh, lung there may be lung fibrosis also in term and there may be the venoclusive uh, procedure due uh, where due to venoclusive uh, occlusion they may have repeated uh, pulmonary hypertension may be there patient uh, there patient may also patient with sleep dyspnea and chronic uh, long term correct So I think it's mostly patients who have recurrent in episodes of ACS that usually present with pulmonary fibrosis and pulmonary and scattered honey combing on CT scan, which you may find in these patients. So the crux, basically, I think what everybody is coming back to and why we have spent so much time on acute chest syndrome and the initial presentation by Chetan is that what is critical in sickle cell disease uh, and lung involvement is prevention of recurrent episodes of acute chest syndrome, which is 
eventually going to lead to a lot of these chronic changes including uh, pulmonary hypertension so um, dr anirudh is there any association between sickle cell disease and obstructive sleep apnea um, uh, the studies which have uh, been done regarding this and which uh, i have come across that uh, they don't uh, give a uh, definite link between increase in chances of obstructive sleep apnea and uh, uh the sickle cell disease but uh, uh i would like to hear views of uh, other panel members also that if they have come across any such uh, studies which uh, show that uh, there, there is any definite link to one definite link between sickle cell disease and obstructive sleep apnea i think it is the other way around patients with sleep disordered breathing which is untreated and also have sickle cell disease they are more prone for vaso occlusive events because of nocturnal hypoxia so identification and treatment of sleep disorder breathing in a case of sickle cell disease is very important this is what i understand uh, actually i get i get the cases from the hematology for secondary polycythemia and uh, evaluation for osa if anything hypercoagulable state and uh, chronic hypoxia is one of the cause for polycythemia so if you really treat your osa as well polycythemias will come down so this uh, there is a sleep apnea is the hypoxia what happens a sequential drop in hypoxia and the lung disease what is uh, persisting as a nocturnal uh, this thing uh, that will act like a confounding factors to detect more and more ahis which are low they will always be hypoxia some amount of hypoxia will be there because hypoxia in age related no no as as we move on the pao2s around 55 to 60 are okay and if they have a mild sleep apnea they will manifest more for nocturnal hypoxia secondary polycythemia pah those things so when they really get a ph very early because of recurrent hypoxia then we screen them early without even having more symptoms so sleep apnea have to be treated well and screened well in a sickle cell disease if they have mildly obese or non obese also because they have a borderline hypoxia and a pulmonary hypertension that invariably without being having a osa symptoms per se means they don't have snoring they don't have uh, like excessive daytime sleepiness these symptoms they don't have it's a ph for us gives a clue uh, to go and evaluate for a sleep apnea so the early screening can be done for a sickle cell disease who is a known sickle cell disease we will definitely treat their osa well uh, uh, that makes their uh, sickling disease treatment also well because the repeated hypoxia will not happen and ph on long run will not rise further yeah, so i think what data definitely is associated yeah data is saying that there is an association especially in children of nocturnal desaturation and sickle cell disease and it is associated with painful crises in children so that that so that is one factor and as uh, chetan has said that sleep apnea in itself because of hypoxia will worsen the sickle cell uh, disease and presentation so i think it's a all causes which uh, really causes hypoxia correct 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 so uh, moving on uh, pulmonary hypertension and sickle cell disease is it common and uh, how would you manage it diagnose and manage it so any any lung disease right from the nose to a uh, airway in the left heart disease ph can happen and uh, any disease which is a chronic lung disease or it might be vascular airway parenchymal it's mainly in a sickling disease it's a vascular vascular events causes more early pulmonary hypertension vascular compared to a parenchymal and obstruction obstructive airway disease obstructive disease like asthma will not cause ph very early COPD causes pulmonary hypertension very early. Parenchymal disease, reversible disease will not cause pulmonary hypertension. Pulmonary fibrosis will cause pulmonary hypertension. Vascular, apart from pulmonary embolism, PAH is due to more of in situ thrombosis and other things or recurrent hypoxia can cause pulmonary hypertension. They are multifactorial reasons. So when you really evaluate for pulmonary hypertension, the first differential diagnosis since it is vascular related is pulmonary thromboembolism is gone unless it is a ct ct ph or chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension most of the time it will not be a proximal pulmonary thromboembolism because we know occlusive diseases will be distal in these cases because the rbcs have to reach a size of 0.8 mm size to get the occlusion so it will not happen in the major blood vessels ph 
so it will mainly anticoagulant madam you asked for anticoagulant reason one of the digital chronic thromboembolic hypertension is one of the cause for chronic anticoagulant therapy in these cases so yes. apart from that if it is not there and pulmonary hypertension is there pulmonary hypertension one of the cause secondary causes is obstructive sleep apnea if that is also taken care and your pah will not rise and if it is not a chronic hypoxia if it is a intermittent hypoxia the pah evaluation if it is really causing a symptoms if it is a mild ph or a 6 minute walk test is really tough and uh, this is a pre capillary hypertension so normally very rarely few cases require a right heart catheterization few cases require a ph therapy so ph secondary causes first you treat the disease primary we have to treat for a secondary pulmonary hypertension we should because there are lot of drugs for ph less of a disease which requires treatment so if ph is not due to pulmonary embolism if it is not due to this thing the explanation will come to only in situ thrombosis and when you really go for these kind of patients rule out other causes of ph like connective tissue disorders which are associated hiv and other th- other all we know occlusive diseases there are very few you know occlusive like butchery and other things can cause we know occlusive diseases so when you really do a right heart catheterization which we are not accessible there are certain things which are vasodilator responses 20 ml drop in the vasodilator responses that can really happen in pre capillary hypertension if it is a pre capillary hypertension in a vasodilator because after vasodilator in a post capillary hypertension patients in a, this thing they actually worsen they no need a vasodilator therapy so if it is response those patient require a ph therapies and other therapies are treatment of the causes like osa and other things which causes the ph and treating the primary disease well so that's how pulmonary hypertensions are managed sometimes they require a chronic disease which causes recurrent fibrosis require a long term home oxygen therapy definitely that helps in preventing the pulmonary hypertension to go up and other secondary causes is osa as dr chetan said it improves a sickling disease if you treat that well ph should not be allowed to go up 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 in the course of the disease because the faster it goes up the more more moribund the patient will become and more ph lowering drug they may not get into a transplant route and all the ph rise should be slowed down by using a ph medication in a few subset of a patients correct so i think managing the underlying disease and managing the pulmonary hypertension that will be basically what you will divide the category into underlying disease would be in this setting you would could consider using hydroxyurea am i right about that uh, chetan because this would be one of the indications for uh, using hydroxyurea then transfusions as needed oxygen therapy and uh, for managing the pulmonary hypertension as such i was reading some article which was mentioning about using uh, endothelin 1 receptor antagonist bosentan and uh, epoprostenol and some data on uh, phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors like sildenafil so i mean specifically for this subset of pulmonary hypertension related hypertension though i think it is still very nascent there is no specific guidelines based on this uh, it's not even mentioned specifically in the guidelines for pulmonary hypertension management but there is some data on maybe the use of these two categories of drugs if there is for managing the pulmonary hypertension specifically if it is significant so uh, interestingly i think i i was also reading that about 11% of uh, adults have pulmonary hypertension as part of their chronic of their sickle cell uh, chronic lung disease spectrum so uh, that's also an interesting thing of course if it is secondary to other factors like co- coexistent um, obstructive sleep apnea or other coexistent disease and of course we need to manage uh, that as well so um, uh, moving on uh chetan what are the various pft abnormalities that you would find in these patients you know you have a patient say say for example even a patient who has come to you as just a health checkup and apparently has a uh, sickle cell uh, anemia i mean what are the various things that you could see in these patients uh so basically there was this some interesting uh, data that came up from the sickle cell registry this is registry yes. in the pre hyper uh, uh pre hydroxyurea era and they surprisingly found that 90% of the patient had some or the other uh, pft abnormality and majority was mild restrictive disease and again this mild restrictive disease comes back to your repeated episodes of acute uh, chest syndrome leading to scarring and all 
and they also found mm-hmm. out that there is mild uh, reduction in uh, dlco per se yes. and some 3 to 5% of obstructive uh, defects as well on pfts and like we already spoke most of the children or children uh, come with common uh, like concomitant bronchial asthma so they also have obstructive defects and it is also proven that sickle cell disease per se can lead to hyperreactive airways so there again you can find obstructive airway pattern and so it is more like 90% of the patients have mild respiratory defect for sure and some uh, pro- uh, proportion can have obstructive de- disease with restrictive asthma so mixed disorder correct so i think the important thing here was that i i was reading that there was one study in all the data that you were mentioning is that showed that uh, in sickle cell disease the drop in fev1 was 49 ml per year compared to an average of 20 to 26 ml per year irrespective of the presence of uh, airway hyperreactivity so that's a very interesting thing so maybe the, and there was one recommendation in another study where they were saying that in children you would monitor then who don't have history of airway disease in sickle cell disease would monitor their pfts at least once a year to see whether there is some unmasking of airway disease and of course then in the other patients you would take it as uh, need based so uh, moving on we've been talking about transfusions in these patients getting the hemoglobin up to between 9 10 11 uh, i mean what happens to transfusion related injury would you suspect it how would you differentiate it you know when you are you have a patient with acute chest syndrome like is your threshold uh, more in these patients to uh, have a transfusion related injury uh, i mean anyone anybody can take this the transfusion related uh, uh, lung injury will happen uh, only if it is in, 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 in the whole blood transfusion that is all been obsolete now now it's all component therapy the yeah. incidence of transfusion related injury has come down <laughs> and more of uh, in uh, exchange transfusions these are all new modalities of treatment uh, and uh, aferet aferesis will be used by hematologists uh, on the way the bloods are transfused nowadays are uh, very good modalities means uh, leukocyte depleted and all those things they they use and <laughs> but <laughs> blood transfusion if it is a massive transfusion the risk of uh, transfusion related lung injury it's not like a trauma conditions where you will see uh, trolley happening more and more in trauma if there is a vascular injury till you get the problem to be solved we give 20 uh, 20 units 30 units though there it is high one or two units of blood transfusion should not be any problem but if they have a repeated veno occlusive diseases and uh, we challenge the rbc component therapy there the risk of small risk of transfusion related lung injury is there so you should be a low threshold of transfusion unless it is really warranted so the cut off rates of uh, transfusion for uh, the hemoglobin for particular level is more important so uh, normally the transfusions are not happening more unless it is less than 6 or 7 causing dyspnea and other things uh, which really changes their management we don't use transfusion we still uh, use it to try to avoid it but sometimes we can't avoid and it will be so less when we use it acutely yeah the chances so are think- less in this kind of patients but it can happen so as you rightly said i think the practice is to gradually increase the hemoglobin rather than at once because the threshold that they see more a more amount of cycling is when the hemoglobin is less than 7 so as long as you are maintaining it above 7 and above you don't have to rush in to uh, get the hemoglobin straight away to 10 or 11 so you start with one or two transfusions a day like uh, sir has said look depleted or just simple uh, rbcs and gradually build the hemoglobin meanwhile if the patient is still hypoxic take the support of additional oxygen support and that will prevent further cycling so when i think 7 is a cut off is what i read from the literature so anything above 7 you have to go, go very slowly and if it is too low as in like 4 and 5 that is when they go for exchange transfusions correct so that's a good point that you brought across is that we don't have to maintain high hemoglobin levels i think that is a important thing because the sometimes the trigger to give transfusion is you know the need to transfuse is very high for some people so it's not necessarily needed a hemoglobin of 7 is good for us so uh, coming back to you dr helenapa uh, when and how would you coordinate with a hematologist in a workup and treatment of sickle cell disease i mean are there any loopholes where 
you know we think that when a patient is coming no, no, with, the, with the changing dy- dynamics of healthcare and all uh, we as a pulmonologist are learning new inputs from all the where and there's so much of information on uh, on the net or uh, the fast progress of a science is such that when you are uh, confined to certain particular specialty we tend to know more and more about those diseases we may know more about the diseases which are lung we may know more about this these things the hematologists who are treating more sickling they have new investigative modalities we really don't know even the oncologist at all sometimes we don't even know what is pdl means you know sometimes they send for all the ebers and other things biopsy and all lot of changes are happening so it's always good to involve the hematologist early in their management because normally they are not like uh, when you are working in a small setup they are not routinely available in, at, at you they might be visiting for you so if you have a certain situation in the crisis ask for a help so any input any new learning any small inputs uh, can change the diagnosis or can change the management it might be a one thing little advice from them so they may get to a diagnosis sometimes in a leukemia or a lymphoma they don't even do a biopsy you know they just get in a peripheral smear and do do a blood based test and the treatment is on for acute leukemia and uh, pneumonia the first presentation of aml and pneumonias we have seen so it's always good to involve the hematologist they are really good in hemoglobinopathy but we are really good in hemoglobin dissociation curves in icu so we'll try to maintain the oxygenation and other things it's a learning from both sides better to involve them early uh, while you are practice if they are available otherwise on phone and whatsapp uh, you can get the information and long run these patients has to be managed from the hematologist point of view on a long run intermittently you can give your inputs regarding their lung diseases or predominant problem is uh, orthopedics and they have those things and th- that's the way it has to be in real practice you know you have a predominant disease which is asthma or copd or some chronic lung disease or ipf we manage and there are some comorbidities it's a predominant disease which is affecting them so we are we should take a responsibility of handling them and hand holding uh, till the journey on based on their natural history of a disease so involving hematologist if it is a known case of his you involve them early or if you are diagnosed take their help it always helps and solves the problem and there are newer things which are might be coming which we don't know uh, and uh, they normally enlighten us and uh, our thinking process in treating the patients also improves that's yeah. what i feel sometimes you know the only thing is when they come they write this whole list of two page investigations which then then you are thinking kya karna hai aur kya nahi karna hai because they that don't want only... to come and see every day because so, the one investigation will come after 15 days i will review after the investigations but so we report, want uh, one yeah. the cloud is cleared when the acute chest syndrome is cleared the patient becomes all right they want to make the opd patient calm and you have to do all that since you have admitted under you you do all the cleaning job counseling and everything and then give the patient uh, like a bread butter jam on opd basis <laughs> yeah that's how it is yeah correct and i think considering that we have you should you should drag them and put a chain to the patient so that they will help us in dragging so that you are calm every day and see your patients correct correct because sometimes as you said there is so much changing in the field of uh, medicine that you don't know what tests what and sometimes the analysis of these tests also is different in different conditions there is such small changes in the analysis of that hemoglobin electrophoretic reports also so it is important also uh our society is also becoming increasingly uh litigious <laughs> so we we should also you know when you have complex diagnosis like this it is probably better to involve and get a stamp of uh, a specialist yes chetan you were saying something sorry so yeah i think we should also look at uh, getting off this medical legal aspects with all this educated patients right now yeah absolutely they sometimes don't trust you now when you're saying yeah. something that is not involving your speciality they will say how before the ct report this reaches to you of the lung <laughs> normally before our problem. ct report reaches to us it has gone in the whatsapp to delhi madras all india us also we are the one we have identified the problem and order for ct chest it has to ideally come to us before it reaches uh, Uh, it has uh, gone everywhere and come and most of the time it creates too much of stress because they read about that disease and come back and uh, otherwise if they have come to us first only we have consulted in a way it has to be explained that doesn't happen now on nowadays correct correct so chetan would you i mean since you are a transplant uh, specialist 
Uh, would you look at lung transplant? Would uh, any of these patients with chronic uh, sickle cell disease, lung disease, be candidates for lung transplant? Yeah. So to be very frank, I actually never even thought of uh, looking at transplant in a sickle cell disease. That never struck my mind. I've been reading about lung transplant in many diseases like PAM. Now I have two cases where there was pneumonectomy done on one side. They have only one lung and they've come for transplant opinion. I was beating my head for that, but I never even thought of reading about a sickle cell disease and lung transplant. And you have no indication now. I went to the literature. I found one case report, yes, yes. which was published, which was actually done in 2011 and published in 2013 from University of Pittsburgh. So they did a successful lung transplant for a patient with worsening pulmonary hypertension, okay. despite being on maximal therapy, a younger guy, 17 years old guy. Of course, they had a lot of challenges. Basically, a straightforward lung transplant itself comes with a lot of challenges. We keep fighting for complications every day, and this adds to a lot of additional complications. But I'm glad they published data that the patient was doing absolutely fine even after two years of transplant. So I don't know what happened after that. But yes, they did a transplant for sickle cell disease associated pulmonary hypertension. Pulmonary hypertension, correct. So the post transplant I mean, lung also the sickling can happen, right? Yes, sir, so that is that a major you need a concern for transplant them. or hemato hemato transplant and then a lung transplant. I don't know. I don't know yeah. about that. The problem so still persists after a transplanted lung. So they addressed uh, to few intraoperative uh, concerns. Like usually when we do transplants, most of the surgeons take uh, previously used to take it on uh, cardiopulmonary bypass, and now they do it on ECMOs. So the major concern there is to avoid that, to avoid bleeding complications, and to avoid further transfusions. So they did this back then in 2011 without a cardiopulmonary bypass, and they proved it successful. And they also stated that probably this is. Suppo uh, supposed to be the strategy when you do a lung transplant and they also came up with a lot of concerns of sickling post transplant but apparently the patient did well for two years without any issues i don't maybe know you that. should write to them and ask them what is happening to that patient no it's it's, it's interesting right because very true, very true. i mean it's always always nice to know what is happening because it starts somewhere yeah, it has true. to start somewhere. And so, that is the only published case report on yes. regarding lung transplant. It is, it is only, only with published this society, report. all the pulmonologists, one case will come to you through uh, through this platform, probably. <laughs> but it has been mentioned in articles, yes, that you could choose it as an option for uh, progressing pulmonary hypertension in sickle, chronic sickle cell disease, not improving on standard therapy. So uh, you mentioned something about hematopoietic uh, transplant when would you consider that i mean that was not in my anticipated list of questions but since you mentioned it dr renapa <laughs> when i mean i, I was, was I, See, I, I, I i feel doing a lung transplant for a sickling disease is not the idea that is not the root cause yes. it is an yes. effect you are treating we are not treating the cause the cause absolutely uh, i don't recommend a lung transplant for a sickle disease i would right. rather make a sickling not coming into his uh, uh, this thing. So if you do it earlier, they should not get acute chest syndrome. Is there any way, that's why we have to involve, is there any way that you do something in the bone marrow at early stage at birth or during the antenatal diagnosis in such a way? I don't know. I really don't know. So I don't know means I don't know. And if I it's a bone marrow, it's had, hemoglobin. Yeah, I wish we had a hematologist to answer this question, but I was reading <laughs> I, I, somewhere that it could be considered in some specific cases in children. It's not really recommended in adults, and, but in children, I was reading, and I can't remember where I read it. Ever since uh, they asked me to moderate this session, I'm helter skelter running and on reading on this so topic. That solves the sickling problem, and you will not get into a lung transplant at all. Correct. But I don't think it's still the recommended standard of care for uh, sickle cell disease. It was something only in, uh, you know, in uh, a certain condition that they had said that they could recommend a hematopo hematopoietic uh, stem cell transplant. So. Uh, I think I've come to the last question for Abhishek. Abhishek, would you vaccinate patients with sickle cell disease and which vaccination would you recommend for these patients? Ma'am, sickle cell patients are always in a venoocclusive state due to which they have an autosplenectomy in them. So due to this autosplenectomy, they are more prone to infection. It's yes. The capsulated bacteria like uh, hemoglobin influenza B, Meningococcal bacteria. Again, uh, we have streptococcus pneumonia, ma'am. So we could like to, uh, I could like to vaccinate in each and every case of sickle cell anemia with pneumococcal vaccine. Now, which is in a routine in pediatric case now. Again, hemophilus influenza B is also routine now. 
again meningococcal pneumonia ma'am uh, meningococcal meningitis ma'am in that vaccine is also advised for uh, cell anemia case ma'am for uh, meningococcal ma vaccines ma'am there are two strain of that vaccine that is uh, one is menotra menotra which should be given uh, below 55 year and is uh, second is menomy which should be given for age than 55 year ma'am so vaccination is must for every case of sickle cell anemia to prevent this uh, infection from this uh, bacteria this uh, this bacterial infection because as we know acute chest syndrome the most common cause uh, is the infection so by vaccinating these patients we can prevent at least this bacterial infection in the in the cases ma'am correct so influenza pneumococcal and meningococcal so we have a few questions from the audience we uh, dr venkata mohan has asked how to manage sickle cell crisis in pregnancy i really wish we had a hematologist i don't know if i can answer this question can any of y'all and what are the drugs Just we can give in pregnancy don't get involved in it <laughs> <laughs> that is my first you know so in fact uh, sickle cell patients should be advised medically legally pregnant. see don't take this thing you involve first the gynecologist involve the hematologist the absolutely back side and see whatever chest related problems are there you give a services with a intensivist it saves your day because we are treating two in these situations uh, and when you take up that job it becomes very 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 tough in the womb the child will have fetal hemoglobin fetal hemoglobin and he will not die or it will not have any problem So, so in, you should involve the specialist and pregnancy. It is a tough situation. So that's what I meant. You know, I, I am not discouraging. It's a great question, and uh, I am amazed with the kind of questions which are coming in. But uh, this in a practical dealing it on ground, you need to be uh, treating this case in a higher center or a tertiary care center or a quaternary center where in-house hematologists and uh, intensive care team is there. and then only the problem can be solved in this and uh, as routinely uh, how you are managing the other cases we can manage when it comes to a pregnancy it depends on what stage of pregnancy it is there 12 weeks or 24 weeks or 36 weeks the best thing can happen in pregnancy is if they are pre terminal uh, means it's 38 weeks and all deliver the baby first then it becomes yeah. easy to treat so if it is like 24 to 28 weeks uh, it is really really challenging we can't take radiology investigations we can't take there are some limitations we have sonology then it is really challenging counseling the patients uh, and it is going to be a tough madam i feel uh, that's the way uh, i am in my hospital because it's really tough in a pregnancy and these kind of tough cases uh, will be tough uh, for everyone correct uh, i feel the I same think... with dr pratibha also yeah i think i think one of the things that one i i am i'm assuming would consider is that because uh, you know we we're talking about veno occlusive phenomena in sickle cell disease i'm assuming these patients would be on some antiplatelets or anticoagulation what they do like for precious precious pregnancies uh, you know or with the miscarriages in the past is just my thought i'm not a gynecologist but i'm just thinking aloud uh, there's the continuation of the question is what is the role of aspirin in acute chest syndrome due to sickle uh, cell disease yeah chetan would you like to give your thoughts on that to be very frank i really i don't have an exact answer for this so i think anticoagulation has been spoken about but antiplatelets in an acute yeah, thing is not going to work because so most of the vasoclusive phenomenon is because of sickle cells per se at the microvasculature level So it is not a proper thrombus or anything. So either it is fat embolism leading to issues because of fat necrosis, or sickling cells per se leading to uh, peripheral vaso occlusion. So I mean, if you look at it that way, I don't see any role of anti-thrombotic agents as such. Correct. Uh, any thoughts, Doctor Hiranapa, on this aspirin? There is another uh, aspirin and another question. Yeah. Can we start just, aspirin for preventive purpose in sickle cell patients? Mm -hmm. I don't think see this acts. aspirin is a uh, it's like uh, you want to give anticoagulant but you don't want to take it and monitor so you want so to do something for something <laughs> you take antiplatelet no no tkr transplant uh, this uh, orthopedicians they say tkr it needs 6 weeks in the guidelines for dvt or till they are ampullated they say ecosprin is enough i know i have seen lot of cases i operated thousands then you don't involve me at all we tell like that so it's 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 very tricky call of using a ecosprin But if there is a pulmonary embolism, treat with anticoagulant. 
i don't think uh, ecosprin has a role but if he has other risk factors associated means if he is a diabetic if they have a dyslipidemia and this thing definitely their ecosprin's role is there correct i think that's very nicely put uh, one question from uh, ajay lanjewar from nagpur any drugs or foods to be avoided in sickle cell disease which can lead to crisis i think uh, one thing that i read was is you should avoid uh, iron overload yes so free iron and heme iron they cause more damage further and that is a major risk factor for development of pulmonary hypertension and sickle cell disease so i can correlate that here probably that is one that i've come across to avoid iron overload excess so, iron yeah. supplementation yes yeah. yeah because very often you will find that these patients are on folic acid and iron supplements and in the peripheries once the hemoglobin is low they directly start them on iron therapy rather than evaluating them so evaluating maybe that is has, that has to be taken care of correct foods i'm not sure i mean i don't know why he specifically asked that question but food i'm not sure they say refined oils i don't know uh, i really don't know whether fat embolism or this thing or uh, dehydration alcohol uh anything which causes dehydration anything which causes uh, those things uh, specifically i don't know that's where uh, so fried food and will... fried food which can lead to increased hmm. thirst okay good good point thank you i would have not thought of that dr hiranapa so, uh, so i think uh, i don't think we have any more questions uh, any other comments from the panelists on any or or any uh, other I, i feel whatever might be the disease the concepts for the lung vq mismatches or whether it is a scent whether it is a parenchymal this thing you see the disease and how it affects their lung whether it is a sleep or whether it is a oxygenations whether it is a ventilation so the concept conceptual base of tr uh, treatment is important you don't have to know the disease if you do your pathway of investigations and navigate to the patients and doing the available investigations there are certain areas of gray zone where you need a specialist in point like interventional radiologists and other specialists come into a picture there the problem solving can happen in any disease uh, it most of the diseases uh, in a routine practice 90% or 85% we manage well the last 10 15% of our patients we really need some kind of help who has intellectual and who is calm not making the patient totally fear, uh, fearful and uh, taking the confidence of patients those people we involve in the care means will definitely get to a reach to a diagnosis of any disease in life in a routine practice in pulmonology sometimes we see rare cases common things normally commonly happen rare things rarely happen but our conceptual way of treatment should go on so we we will uh, uh, our mind will definitely when you are treating a long larger group of patients it will definitely give the answer and it is a um, human experiences of previous treatment uh, definitely will give the answer to you that's what i feel uh, when when i am practicing in last 15 years uh, we ultimately reach the diagnosis we'll get stuck with one procedure somewhere or we will get with some person <laughs> somewhere we have to make the diagnosis i missed one question from dr tridip who said do patients who have sickle cell disease and had a sclerectomy and not vaccinated for pneumococcal are they more prone for acute chest syndrome i think anyways they are more prone for acute more chest prone. syndrome irrespective of whether they have had a sclerectomy or, oh. or uh, not yes uh, chetan any closing no, remarks point. yes ma'am about the pregnancy yes, i could like to tell them ma'am about pregnancy the question was there ma'am uh, sickle cell anemia is a hypercoagulable state ma'am again pregnancy is also a hypercoagulable state yes so if we know a patient with sickle cell anemia it's our job to counsel the patient to not get pregnant just like in pulmonary hypertension cases we tell patient try to avoid pregnancy it may be a fatal to you so We should counsel no, the patient no. to not get pregnant. Uh, I think that's what exactly we have to know. We can say of pulmonologists, it has to be a, it has to be How a to be multidisciplinary decision between yeah, uh, the pathologist and the gynecologist. But yes, what you are saying is right. It is a hypercoagulable state, and sickle cell disease is also uh, uh, has a tendency for uh, venoocclusive disease. So yes, as I said, it is. it is it is a conscious decision which the patient will have to make in consultation with the hematologist no what what we can do is 
See, if the patient, patient is going to get a pregnancy, if he has a known sickle cell trait, they can screen the husband, see whether he is also having a trait. If he develops and deliver a child who is having a trait because it's a homozygous manifestation. Yes. So if the parent is also genetic testing and mother is also genetic test, it's a single parent, they can still have a child. If both have a trait, there is a 50% chance or 100% chance of getting a uh, sickle cell baby. The yeah. amniocentesis, uh, early screening of a child, because you can't tell any person not to get a pregnant. Pregnancy is con uh, contraindicated only if they have PAH, which is very high. If he is a sickling disease, that can be a mortality. If mm -hmm. PAH is normal, nobody on the earth can deny not having pregnancy, their individual call. So for that, we need a counseling and tell them whether there are any avenues getting the things involved, the gynecologists, counselors, and uh, the pediatricians, whether they are well equipped to manage a child uh, and the mother during the course of their pregnancy. And that's the way we should go uh, in treating the pregnancy. Once it has happened, abortion or MTP rules are also very strict. No, uh, uh, unless there is an anomaly, you can't abort them also. Yes, sir. Yeah. Correct. So I think uh, that's like that's another topic in itself for a multidisciplinary dis uh, discussion. But uh, it's good we closed on a, a very interesting uh, uh, discussion at the end. So coming now we've come to the end. I don't think we have any more questions. Let me just cross check once. <clears throat> no, I don't no think questions. Have yeah, no more questions. So uh, thank you, everyone. I must take this opportunity to thank uh, our uh, very intelligent panelists who have helped make this discussion very interesting. Dr. Hiranapa Chetan for his lovely uh, case presentations, Abhishek and uh, and uh, Anirudh. So just to summarize, uh, sickle cell disease and lung involvement is uh, often missed and not diagnosed because we are not aware of uh, its presentation and uh, less understood. However, it is a cause, uh, you know, as, as much as more than 20% have fatal pulmonary complications and we know that acute chest syndrome can lead to death in 25 to 50% of uh, the adolescent patients. So it is very important that we pick it up early. We know the various manifestations of uh, lung involvement and sickle cell disease. You have the acute chest syndrome, you have the airway disease in younger population, you could have uh, nocturnal desaturation and some correlation with sleep apnea. You could have uh, pulmonary hypertension as a presentation because of its you know, occlusive nature, or you could have chronic uh, sickle cell, uh, chronic lung disease, SCCLD, which can have uh, pulmonary fibrosis, which is primarily related to recurrent uh, acute uh, chest syndromes and uh, scarring. And you could have uh, dyspnea of uh, chronic etiology and pulmonary hypertension. So I think we've had a very fruitful discussion on how to diagnose this, how to pick it up, how to manage it. And I must thank uh, CCI for giving us all this opportunity and coming up with this brilliant topic for discussion. I must say they come up with very interesting topics, something that we could not think of every time. And it's uh, no small feat to have 208 webinars with not a single repetition of a topic in pulmonology. I didn't even know we could have so many discussions. So uh, kudos for that. And thank you, everyone. Good night. Have a have a lovely evening. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am.